Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's Dealer On webinar, How to Be a Merchandising Master in Eight Steps. My name is Eliana Raggio, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's webinar is being presented by Dealer On. For anyone who isn't familiar with Dealer On, well, we're an award-winning website development company and digital agency best known for our amazing SEO, the absolute best customer service, and the highest converting website designs in the industry, including the brand new Chameleon Responsive Website Platform. We're so committed to lead conversion, optimization, and customer service that DealerOn is still the only company in the industry brave enough to offer a money-back lead guarantee program. Does your website company guarantee you a 50% lift in leads or your money back? Well, maybe you should check us out at our gorgeous brand new DealerOn website at DealerOn.com. We have a great show in store for you today. We're very pleased to have Devin Daly as our presenter today. Devin Daly is the co-founder and CEO of SpinCar, the leading provider of automated 360-degree content creation tools. He's uniquely informed on cutting-edge techniques that increase dealer website and VDP effectiveness, working closely with major automotive groups and dealerships, as well as marquee fashion clients like Louis Vuitton, and Nike. Devin understands how to lift conversion rates and boost website stickiness, driving more revenue and profit to a dealership. He combines a deep understanding of state-of-the-art e-commerce best practices with a true empathy for the problems dealers face today. Devin is a very active and very respected member of the automotive community, and he can be reached at devin at spincar.com. Now, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the question feature located on the corner of your screen to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer those questions of general interest. If we're unable to get to your question live, we'll try to respond to you by email later today. Also, don't forget, a link to download a copy of this webinar recording will be emailed to you later today for your reference. Please feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. And guess what? Our good friends at SpinCar, they're giving away an awesome prize today on the webinar. One of you lucky webinar attendees is going to win three free months of SpinCar. SpinCar automatically stitches together standard interior and exterior vehicle photographs into a super interactive 360 degree display with tagged touchable hotspots. With analytics that track every interaction your shoppers make with your inventory, an average increase in time spent on VDPs of 56% and a guaranteed 10% increase in leads, SpinCar is the go-to 360-degree automotive merchandising solution for dealers nationwide. What a tremendous prize for your dealership and a great way to improve your merchandising coming into the holiday season. You have to be on the live broadcast to win it, though, so stay tuned. You could be the one walking away with this amazing prize today. Also, at the conclusion of this webinar, you're going to receive a short survey. Please fill it out because we're always looking for quality feedback from our audience. Today we're going to randomly select a couple of people from all those completed surveys to also win some Google prizes. And hey, do you tweet much? We hope you do. We'd love to see what you have to say about today's presentation, so please tag us in it. You can use hashtag DealerOnWebby. I'm at Eliana Raggio. You can also hit up Devin Daly at SpinCar360. We look forward to seeing what you're saying. So let's get started. Let's learn how to be a merchandising master in eight steps. Devin Daly, how are you, sir? Fantastic, Aliana. Thank you for such a kind introduction. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's always good to have a brand new Dealer On webinar presenter. Now, this is your first time doing a webinar with me, so I'm very, very excited. Audience, don't be too hard on the guy. I know you ask a lot of tough questions. Actually, yeah, ask the tough questions. I'm sure Devin can handle it. <laughs> Can't you, Devin? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Now, as my regular audience knows, we don't do a lot of, of presentations on merchandising. There's not a lot of people out there talking about this. But you, you're coming right at it, and you're going to be able to tell everyone in eight steps everything that they need to do to really master merchandising online. And I'm very excited about this because I think if there's one thing that dealers definitely need help with would be how they merchandise their cars online. So I know you have a lot to get to. It's going to be a great day. Where do we begin? What are the kinds of things we're going to be learning about today? Absolutely, Aliana. So there's three main themes um, of places that we see opportunity for improvement in the automotive space. The first is a way to optimize your website and optimize your merchandising. And 
these are divided into the eight steps, but there's really kind of three main takeaways, and then the fourth, which is the Q&A session. So we'll talk about ways to optimize your website for conversion, for engagement, for better performance. Secondly, we think there's a lot of opportunity at the handoffs. So that's the handoff between your internet sales department and your actual sales team on the floor. And then third, we'll talk about how to better understand your entire online sales funnel, how to measure that more granularly, and then again, bring that full circle back to how to optimize that website. So I guess before we jump into things though, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about our background because I do think this is pertinent to what we're gonna talk about today. Unlike a lot of people that have been on this webinar series, myself and my company, we don't come from the automotive space. Myself, I come from a finance background. Um, so prior to starting Spin Car, I was in the venture capital and private equity space. And I think what you'll see is there's a lot of learnings that we had in that space that can really be applied to uh, the automotive sector. After that, though, we got started and we really helped a lot of retailers. Everybody from, like Aliana mentioned, Louis Vuitton, um, who's a very traditional brick and mortar retailer, to very progressive, disruptive e-tailers like Warby Parker. We helped all these companies double, triple conversion rates. Um, and I think this is important because there's a big argument, especially in the venture capital space, about sector expertise. So if you're looking to hire somebody, an internet manager, for example, are you better to hire somebody from the automotive space so that they know the nuances of that industry? Or are you better to hire somebody with an outside perspective? And while you know, I understand that their automotive is very unique and, again, has those nuances and idiosyncrasies, I think our bringing a fresh retail perspective to this industry is helpful. And so we'll talk a lot about that. Before we jump into kind of the eight actionable steps, what I wanted to do is, is identify three main themes that are happening in the automotive market that have sort of led us to these three conclusions and then these eight more granular steps. So first thing, obviously, we all know interest rates are fan Today's auto market's fantastic. Interest rates have not been raised in years. So what does that mean? That means financing is cheap. That means more dollars to consumers, which results in larger vehicle sales, um, higher priced vehicle sales. Obviously, financing is cheap. What does that mean? That means more dollars to the consumers, especially low-end consumers. Second thing, oil is under $50 a barrel. We checked this morning, it was 45 ish when I checked earlier this morning. Again, that means more dollars to consumers. Obviously, you lower-end consumers, higher percentage of their budget goes to gas spend, fuel spend. So again, you've got that consumer benefiting from that lower oil price. And then thirdly, the dollar strengthening. And so this is sort of ties into the first theme that we see in the automotive space, which is things are fantastic in automotive, which can sometimes result in a sense of complacency. Not complacency, but you know, a lot of times when things are going really well, it's easy to think, okay, things are great, what I'm doing is working. But you know, I like to bring a Warren Buffett quote in the famous words of the Oracle of Omaha, whom I saw at the Automotive Forum in New York last year, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. So you know, we firmly believe that this really strong automotive market has, has led to a, not a sense, I, don't, I hate to use the word complacency, but a sense of comfort in current strategies and, and tactics. And we think now's the time when you know, you've got a little bit more free cash flow, things are profitable, to make changes and prepare for changing climates. We think now's the time to experiment Now's the time to look at room for improvement, et cetera. That's the first thing that we see is, you know, we've got this really strong automotive market that's, again, leading to this comfort. Second thing we see is there's a major lag in technologies adopted by the automotive sector and technologies adopted by other sectors. And we'll go into a timeline that talks about the difference in e-commerce merchandising versus automotive merchandising, and I think, you know, we'll find that really helpful. But generally, I mean, right, when we first came into this industry, we saw, like, Reynolds and Reynolds, for example, still using blue screen technology, which is okay, but obviously, there is a lag between these two. What does this result in? This results in a failure to capitalize on the opportunity that the internet revolution presents. And that lag also results in a major, major difference between really high performing dealers and the rest of the population. And so what we did was we did some research that looked at the conversion rate of the Ward's auto dealer excuse me, Ward's Auto E-Dealer 100 versus the rest of the dealer population. And what we found was that the conversion rate between your average Ward's Auto E-Dealer and your median conversion rate across the rest of the industry was a staggering four standard deviations apart. What? So that much? People at the top yep, of that Ward's Auto E-Dealer 100 were 
converting at four standard deviations higher than, than the rest of the automotive population. And that's a, a, an increasing gap similar to the widening economic gap for, you know, for lack of a better comparison, which is obviously why you all are here to look at ways to, you know, how do we increase our, our automotive conversions? Um, you know, how do we leverage the opportunity that the internet presents? So before we dive further though, we've got a, a poll question here. So Eliana, if you want to take this over. I absolutely do. All right, audience, guess what? We have three poll questions for you today. The first is on your screen now. We'd love it if you'd get involved so we know what's happening at your dealership. Here's the question. What's the main KPI you use to measure your website's performance? Please select one of the following answers. Is it the number of lead submissions, the time on a VDP, the number of the VDPs that are viewed, or VDP visitor to lead submission conversion rate? Or is it something else entirely? We want to know. What's the main KPI you use to measure your website's performance? Number of lead submissions, time on the vehicle details pages, the number of vehicle details pages that are viewed, or is it a special VDP visitor to lead submission conversion rate that you use, or is it something entirely different? Once we get a majority of those votes in, we're going to close the poll and share the results, and then we're going to see what everyone else is doing at their dealership. And uh, while the votes are coming in, audience, thank you so much for voting. We really, really appreciate it. Um, Devin, is there a correct answer to this? Don't tell me the answer, but I'm just wondering, is there a correct answer to this? <laughs> Uh, maybe not so much correct answer as there's a learning opportunity here. Okay. I'll explain once, once the answer. All right, all right, that's fair enough. All right, audience, thank you so much for your votes. Like I said, we have a couple more poll questions coming your way. Um, before I close this poll, I see somebody wrote in, David wrote in, I chose other, but I use more of a combination of the time on VDP, VDPs viewed, as well as some of the other stuff too. All right, I see what you did there. Okay, okay. but. Um, let's see what the rest of the audience had to say, all right? Let's close this poll and share the results. Mm, I don't know, I'm locked up over here. Here we go. Is it showing? It's not showing, is it? Is it? Okay. 22% yes, of today's audience said they use the number of lead submissions. Now, no one said they use the time on VDP. 17% that said that they use the number of VDPs viewed now, the majority say that they use a VDP visitor to lead submission conversion rate. And then the remaining 17% say that they use something else. So, Devin, what is the learning curve that we need to learn on this? The right answer, let's say. <laughs> sure. Now, the, the top one there, number of lead submissions, is that's sort of a, a baked answer because in a vacuum, looking at number of lead submissions isn't really super relevant. Um, you've really got to look at the conversion rate, which is obviously the fourth one there, because if you're paying for a lot more traffic and you're converting at a lower percentage, you're not really taking advantage or leveraging all that additional traffic that you're driving to the website. So that was sort of what the, this exercise was meant to illustrate, if that makes sense. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And I don't know why. I feel like the screen is locked. Are you showing your screen? You are, right? I am. Yeah. I don't know why it's not showing up. Hmm. Okay, yeah, it totally kicked you out, Devin. Oh, uh, Hold on, I'm trying to get you to, I just asked. I am still not seeing your screen. That is not cool. Um, okay, hold on one second. I'm going to make myself the presenter and then make you the presenter again because it's not coming up. And if it's not showing up on my screen, it's not getting recorded, so I apologize. Okay, I see your, your desktop now. Sorry about that. No problem. Let's hope that doesn't happen with the next two poll questions. Yeah. <laughs> All set, Aliana? Uh, yeah, if you could just put it in. There you go. Perfect. Sorry about that. Yep, sorry about that. Call. Audience, thanks for hanging in there with us while we work this stuff out. So, you know, what we were sort of diving into there was that a lot of dealers don't understand the internet or how to conduct business on the internet. They look at 
the internet is this big, confusing, convoluted market. One thing we noticed is, you know, a large contingency of the dealer population will sub the vast majority of their internet strategy out to vendors. Um, you know, an example is I have this dealer, his name's Rob, um, one of our very first dealers, he's a very successful guy, owns several dealerships, uh, very successful, very wealthy guy. Loves our product, and I call him to review the results and talk about just generally about industry things. And every time, you know, this is probably once a month, every time he's grateful for what we've done together and our product, but always laments about the good old days when selling cars was easy, when you used to be able to just hang balloons and, um, you know, have your sales team look out the window and wait for people to come in and talks about how that was that was when it was easy. And, you know, frankly, it's, it's saddening because, you know, the Internet is the greatest thing in the world for business. It gives you access to millions of people in a split second. It allows businesses to inexpensively experiment. So it's no longer, okay, you have to put out a $10,000 or $15,000 newspaper ad and see if it works. You can run very efficient tests on with $500 on Google AdWords or $500 in PPC or display ads. Um, you, know, you can start to understand your unit economics a lot easier. It allows you to identify hand raisers and service them. It gives you access to, again, millions of people. Um, and its efficiency should dramatically reduce a dealership's operating expenses, but they're not. And the reason for that, we feel, is because this is the third problem that we've identified in the space. There's too much of a focus on pouring dollars into the top of the sales funnel before optimizing your sales funnel and, and preventing leakage. So, you know, this is sort of that the biggest problem that we've identified in the automotive space is in the venture space, for example, you know, if you fund a company, what you want to do is you want to try to identify their unit economics. So what's the lifetime value of a customer? How much is a customer worth? And then how much does it cost to acquire that customer? So it's what's known as a CAC to LTV ratio, cost of acquiring a customer versus lifetime value of a customer. And once you understand those unit economics, you understand that you can essentially put a dollar in and get $3 out. You've solved your funnel problem, and you can just apply as much to the top of that funnel as you want. What we've seen in the automotive space is there's still tons of leakage throughout the, the sales funnel, the internet sales funnel, but people continue to pour more dollars into the top. And so that's that's the biggest problem that we've identified. An example of this is, I'm sure a lot of people on this um, webinar are familiar with the concept of showrooming and how it impacted big box retailers like Best Buy. So just a refresher, showrooming is you know what happened to Best Buy, right? People used to walk into Best Buy, they would look at a TV that they were interested in, They'd check out the picture, they'd turn it around, see if it had the ports they liked, check out you know, the bevel on it, for example, and they'd go home and they'd buy it online. Same thing used to happen at dealerships, right? People used to show up, they would shop your cars, and then they would go over to a dealership, or they'd go online, find whatever dealership had it for cheapest, and go in. What do dealers do? They started using high-pressure selling tactics to reduce showrooming, because obviously if you're paying to get that consumer in, you're engaging with them, um, you know, you're spending salesperson time to present the vehicle. The last thing you want to do is have them go and buy that competing vehicle or that same vehicle from one of your competitors. So what they've done is they've started doing turnovers, started dropping price, um, and what happened is that selling pressure led to a rise in what's known as web rooming. So now as opposed to showrooming where you come into the, the showroom first, whether that's Best Buy or a dealership, Instead, people do all of the research online and then come in just to execute the transaction. And that's happened both in retail and in automotive. So again, showroom, you go into the dealership first, look at the car, then find the cheapest price online. The flip side is, I do all my research online and then I just come into the dealership to execute the transaction. So what does that mean? The entire sale is now one online. This is a very interesting statistic. 68% of shoppers visit less than two dealerships. So what does that mean? That means that, frankly, the vast majority of the time, if you get somebody in your showroom, you're going to close them. So you need to be the first dealership that they enter. It's no longer just about, you know, 10 years ago or five years ago, it was all about winning the click online. Now you've got to win the entire sale online. You know, a lot of people talk about that statistic. Five years ago, people used to visit five dealerships. Now they visit 1.2 on average before making a purchase. But this is even more astounding to me. That 68% of shoppers visit less than two dealerships. Again, basically meaning that the vast majority buy at the first dealership they enter, so you've got to be the first place that they stop. And so last thing we're going to talk about is you know, running your business like a scientific lab, and we'll jump into some of the more actionable ways to do this. And I just wanted to sort of highlight why focusing on the funnel is so important. 
let's say you have 10,000 unique visitors, which is you know a pretty average dealership with a 10% conversion rate. If you can bump that conversion rate to 11%, what would that mean in terms of gross profit? I mean, it would mean tens of thousands of dollars in gross profit and maybe hundreds of thousands in annual take-home pay for a dealer. Um, and so again, that's why we suggest running your business like a scientific lab and looking at ways to improve your conversion rates before dumping more dollars into the top of the funnel. So as I promised, um, talk here quickly about the evolution of merchandising. Um, as you can see on the top is the automotive timeline of merchandising and then on the bottom is e-commerce. As you can see, in 1995 in automotive there were a few websites. Um, then you saw dealer websites start to come around and it was all stock photography. Then you saw people starting to take photos of used photography. About five years ago, we saw some Ken Burns effect slideshow videos come about. And now in 2014, 2015, we see real photos of new. We see live video coming about. We see some 360 content finally emerging in the automotive space. Compare that with e-commerce, and what you'll see is, you know, it's about five years ahead. So, you know, websites were prevalent in 95, and then, for example, in 2014, 360 walk-arounds are, you know, all over the place. So just wanted to sort of highlight that that lag and, you know, how we can take solutions from retail, apply them to automotive, and really find alpha returns. So, Eliana, if we dare, this brings me to the next poll question, which is about <laughs> merchandising. So... Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. All right, audience, your second of three poll questions is on the screen now. We'd love it if you take part in this poll question. We want to know, who currently takes care of all the photos of your vehicle inventory at your dealership? Please select one of the following answers. Do you do it all in-house? Do you have a third-party vendor or photographer who comes in and takes care of it for you? Do you just say, eh, we'll just use stock photos? Or you really, you, you don't know. <laughs> you really have no idea because that's not part of your job. But we would want to know what's happening at your dealership. Once we get a majority of those votes in, we're going to close the poll, share the results, and then we'll find out what everyone is doing at their dealerships, okay? The votes are coming in fast. Audience, thank you so much for participating in the poll questions. We really, really appreciate it. One more time. Who currently takes care of all the photos of your vehicle inventory at your dealership? Do you do it all in-house? Do you have a third-party vendor or photographer who comes in? Or do you just use stock images? or you really have no idea. Audience, thank you so much for voting. We're going to close this poll and share the results. If Devin's ready, Devin, are you ready? Devin, did I lose you? No, I'm here. I am oh, ready. Okay. <laughs> are you ready for this? Here we go. We're going to close this poll and share the results. Okay, the majority of people, 58%, said they do it all in-house. Now, a, a, a big section of them, 37%, say that they have a third-party vendor who comes in or a third-party photographer who comes in and does it all for them. My audience is so smart, Devin, not one single person said that they use stock images. And then we have the remaining 5% who don't have any idea where their photos for their vehicle inventory comes from. Devin, does that help you out? Yeah, it does. No, I appreciate that. Um, our split within our customer portfolio is sort of 50-50, so I, I'm a little surprised to see, and I think even a little bit more uses a third-party vendor or photographer, so I'm a little bit surprised. Um, but yeah, that, that's an interesting indicator. Thank you so much. Okay, now here's the test. Can we get it back to your screen, or do I have to... <laughs> no, it's not working. Okay, so hold on. Let's... Um throw a few clicks over your way and hopefully this will work. There we go. And of course it kicked you out of PowerPoint, didn't it? <laughs> we're back in. Oh, well, we're going to work on this. Okay. Sorry, guys. I've just got to sit through these slides to jump back to where we were. Sorry yeah. about that. Uh, All right, audience. And, and audience, if you have any questions for the great Devin Daly, please don't hesitate to send them along. We're going to do some Q&A session at the end of his presentation. All right. Devin, back to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Eliana. Um, and thanks, everybody, for participating in the poll. And apologize for any technical difficulties. Appreciate you bearing with us here. Um, so now we'll jump into the eight kind of granular steps on how to improve merchandising. And so what you'll notice is the first five that we'll talk about are all about the front end experience for the consumer. And then the last three are more about how do I leverage the data that I get from my merchandising to either help me understand and optimize the experience 
or to improve the handoff or improve pricing techniques, et cetera. So the first five, we'll take a break, we'll do a demonstration of live, you know, live software, and then we'll jump into the three and talk about how we can leverage data to improve. So the first one that we talk about is putting the consumer in control. Um, and again, this goes back to that concept that 68% essentially buy at the first dealership that they enter. So in our opinion, it's no longer about just winning the click. It's no longer about just getting your inventory online. Right? Ten years ago, it was about how often can I have my third-party photography company come out here because I need to get my inventory online as soon as possible. And that still remains very important. But now it's not just about winning the click, it's about winning the entire sale online. So we've got to give the consumer the ability to control the sales process online. We've got to let them experience as much of the buying journey as possible within the confines of your website. Because what happens if somebody comes to your dealership's website, they look at a vehicle that's on your, um, your dealership's website, and then they leave to go research it on admins, for example. Your competition starts targeting them. So they start sending them display ads with the exact same vehicle or a very similar vehicle. So we've got to try to keep them, give them the tools to do as much of the research within the confines of your own website. So that's why we think it's important to embed research information right on your VDB pages. So what do consumers say about the vehicle? What do, um, what does consumer reports say about the vehicle, for example? What does admin say about the vehicle? Excuse me, I also think it's important to show competitive pricing right on your homepage, right on your VDP page, because again, then you don't need to force them to go to Kelly Blue Book to compare. You don't need to force them to go to Auto Trader to compare competitive vehicles. If you build that in right into the website, um, again, you're keeping them on your site as opposed to letting them bounce and continue to get attacked by the slew of competitors. Um, giving the consumer the feeling of control. You know, we'll show this later, but Apple Watch just instituted 360 views on their new watches. So having them, you know, in control of the actual experience, they feel like they're, you know, educating themselves. Um, and then finally, another way to put the consumer in control is to highlight features of the vehicle and let them view those features themselves. And this is important enough that I think it deserves its own, its own slide here. So I think highlighting vehicle features is incredibly, incredibly important. And, you know, there's a huge, huge problem in this market. And I think the biggest problem, right, is that all of us that are in this automotive space, or the vast majority of us, and I, I speak for myself at least, can look at a $70,000 Suburban and a $75,000 Suburban and not really know why one is more expensive than the other. You know, we can look at two VDP pages, $70,000 Suburban, $75,000 Suburban. Why is this one $5,000 more? And that's a huge, huge, huge problem. And so we think you need to make that abundantly clear. You need to include, you know, why that vehicle is more expensive. Does the $75,000 Suburban, does it have a sunroof that only 25% have, or does it have, you know, the bolstered seat, which is part of the prestige package? I think that's a huge problem. The other problem with features that we see, which is what this screenshot is of here, almost always all of the features of a vehicle end up below the fold. You will never see that on a retail e-commerce website. All of the pertinent features of a vehicle or of a piece of inventory will be above the fold where the prime real estate is. You know, you'll see them up above, right where you land on the page. Um, you know, these are the four most important features about that particular unit. Third problem we think in how features are displayed in automotive is they're all textual. You know, you've just got this slew of textual information. We all know that people don't read. You know, the, the best user experience is one that does not require a consumer to read. And so we firmly believe you need to find ways to use graphical or interactive displays. Fourth thing is that they're not prioritized. If you can read this here, you see it says tachometer. I mean, first of all, that being the, f the first option is almost hilarious, right? I mean, what vehicle made in the last 100 years doesn't have a tachometer on it? Um, passenger airbag, same thing. I mean, there's no prioritization here. It's, it's it, frankly, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, and so, you know, we think it's important to use logic to prioritize what is unique and what is of value to that particular consumer. Um, so that's the second step is, you know, use special techniques, whether that's comment generation, whether that's pure cars, and we'll talk more about it, um, to highlight vehicle features. Third thing is to provide an interactive experience. Um, conventional sales wisdom, as most of us know, says that if you can get a person, a prospect, to answer a question that affirms your value proposition, 
they're more likely to believe that value proposition. So if I can get you to essentially sell yourself by telling me what I want you to tell me in a sales conversation, you're more likely to believe that. That is, if you can let someone sell themselves and drive the learning experience, they'll be much more confident in making the buying decision. The problem is most of the sale now occurs online, so that same logic applies online. Now you need to figure out a way to let the consumer sell themselves on your inventory. This is why interactive marketing has become so prevalent in the last five years. People are reading 140 character tweets, or 60 character tweets rather, you know, they don't have time to sit through, you know, a sales presentation on a vehicle. We need to let them interact. I mean, we all know how much higher closing rates are if you get somebody to take a test drive. Same thing applies online. How do we allow somebody to take an online test drive? And so, you know, I think finding interactive software to use that allows, again, them to control it, them to feel like they're selling themselves. Um, you know, how do you give them the ability to go through their own discovery process on your own website? You know, how do you, again, how do you encompass that most of that buying um, journey within your own VDP? And how do you provide essentially a custom learning environment that allows the consumer to have a custom experience, whether they're a 65-year-old retiree or a 16-year-old new driver? Right now, the experiences that we provide in the vast majority of automotive websites are canned regardless of if they're, again, 16, 65, male, female, performance buyer, safety buyer. And that's frankly not optimal. So that's that's the third opportunity that we see through improvement. Fourth again is just differentiate your inventory. Obviously, you know, most OEMs are now mandating websites that look relatively similar. I don't know if you guys saw, but Toyota just announced that they're mandating pricing parity. So pricing equality on new vehicles. So how now do I differentiate myself? So there's mandating a consistent website and they're mandating consistent pricing. I have to find a way to differentiate my inventory and that's what the consumer is going to fall in love with. You know, the, of course it's great to have stories about your dealership and things like that. Um, you know, that's more important than ever, you know, establishing a trusting environment. Um, but they're going to fall in love with the piece of inventory. That, you know, that's what they're coming there for. And so can we tag packages? Can we show this is part of the prestige package which has an MSRP of $6,500? Um, you may need to show why your unit is priced above market. Um, and we think comments is a good way to do this, right? If you can use meaningful comments that show why a vehicle is unique in the market. You know, this is one of only, you know, only one in 25 Toyota Camrys made include this particular package, for example. You know, that's something that's compelling and that's going to catch someone's eye as opposed to the boilerplate comments that we see most of the time. Take a cruise in the new 2016 Chevy Equinox. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot of ways you can do this. But just wanted to highlight that this is another place that, you know, we see a lot of opportunity. And then lastly, use transparency to increase gross. And, you know, again, to, to bring this back, you know, I think there's a whole sort of motif here, which is the sales process has, you know, back in the day, a consumer used to do 99% of the sales process in your dealership. Now they do 99% of the sales process online. So we've got to figure out ways to draw parallels from the in the showroom sales process to the online sales process. And so, you know, we've all had an experience where you've been in an adversarial sales conversation and then we've all had an experience where you've been in a consultative sales conversation. You know, and again, you know, coming from a finance background, there's a an interesting you know, parallel here between if you work with an equity investor versus a debt investor, you've got on one hand a very consultative relationship and on one hand an adversarial relationship. And you know, I think more than ever reputation is important. You know, and so how, how much rage is incited if somebody drives an hour to find a vehicle that's damaged? And so you know, more than ever I think it's important that we use transparency to try to set up that consultative sales environment to try to avoid you know, that, that, that reputation issue that would be caused if somebody would, felt that your dealership was misrepresenting the inventory that it had. And so, you know, some ways to do that, show vehicles from all angles. Make the buyer feel like you're being open. Um, tag blemishes and dings. Um, you know, find ways to just come clean about this wasn't, it's not a perfect vehicle. You're buying it for 5,000 bucks. You know, it has a couple dents and dings. At the end of the day, that's going to make me much more confident to come out to your dealership, and when then when I get there, 
I'm going to be in a much more consultative, you know, much less adversarial mindset. Right? Honest, unbiased comments again. Um, you know, I think there is like an asynchrony of incentives in the automotive space, meaning a lot of times internet departments are so set up to just focus on how many demos can you drive, how many appointments can you set. Does it really matter how many appointments you set if half the appointments get there and they're, pardon my French, pissed off because the representation of the vehicle online was different than what it is in person? You know, and that's the thing is when you're trying to set up these incentive plans, if somebody's set up to just focus on demos as opposed to focused on total gross profit for the dealership, it may create this asynchrony, which is, you know, again, you're just trying to drive people out there no matter what. You're telling them whatever they want to hear, but they get there and then they don't buy. They get pissed off. They write a, you know, a bad review of your dealership. So, um, you know, again, I think transparency is, is absolutely paramount. Um, so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and, and jump into, you know, a demonstration here of, you know, what we consider kind of a bad VDP merchandising experience and what we consider a good VDP merchandising experience. Wanted to quickly show you, you know, what Apple's doing. Obviously, you know, they're the largest company in the world, almost two times the market capitalization of the second leader. Um, so I start here with kind of what we would consider a quote unquote bad VDP. So as you can see, um, the vehicle is cut off, so you don't even have an entire photograph. So not even the entire vehicle is above the fold. Um, and then, you know, you get down here, and again, you've got this... Oh, their header is huge. Yeah, so you've got this huge header that doesn't have, you know, a ton of value in it, right? It's a huge logo with a lot of blank space around here. Um, you've got the vehicle cut off. You've got other vehicles in the background, which is just not a best practice. You come down here, and this is some of the stuff we were talking about with packages. You've got unprioritized textual information about features which is incredibly long. For example, I know how to use control F so I could find what I was looking for, but the vast majority of consumers aren't going to want to, and we'll talk about bounce rates, but they're not going to want to scroll down and try to find, does this thing have a sunroof, for example. Um, you know, obviously that's not a, a pleasant consumer experience. You know, it's not really a super clear call to action. You've got a black, which is one of the worst colors for a call to action. So, you know, just some, some real room for improvement. And then we'll show, you know, what we consider a, a good VDP page. So here you've got a VDP page, Scott Clark Toyota, um, dealer on site, obviously. Um, <laughs> as you can see, all of their information, that's normally doesn't pop down like that, all of their information is up above the fold. Um, you know, you've got, here in the description, you've got really good comments, you know, Bluetooth, backup camera, those are things that people are looking for. You've got an interactive display that allows people to rotate the vehicle. You've got the ability to click hotspots. You're highlighting those special features, so you've got those special features tagged. So you've got, you know, your backup camera, your XM radio right there. Um, you know, same type of thing here. So here you've got an example where you can pop up and again let the consumer have that same type of experience, have a yes. transparent experience. I got news. Um, uh, seriously, I mean, you know, I've made no bones about it. I've never worked in a dealership. I've never had to do this kind of merchandising, but from a consumer side. This is really, really cool. <laughs> I really, really like this. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you like it, Aliana. Yeah, so, and, you know, in my opinion, you know, right, I mean, this accomplishes some of those things. It doesn't accomplish all of them. There's room for improvement with or without our solution. But, you know, I think what it does is it helps with the transparency side of things. It's been proven time and time again that if you can let a consumer rotate an object, they feel that you're being transparent. It's something intuitive. You know, I mean, how many of us have, bought a pair of jeans on Amazon, and when we got the jeans, they had some weird lace pattern on the back, and we were incited with rage. So, you know, we've been conditioned as consumers to want to take an in-depth dive before we take the next action, and that's what this allows you to do. It also gets the vehicle details above the fold. It also tags the special features of the vehicle with graphical, interactive touch points, so I don't have to read through that list of 500 things that we saw on the last page. Um, you know, so just wanted to show you guys, you know, some examples, um, you know, of, of different VDP pages and, you know, different merchandising experiences that are out there. So without further ado, we will try one last time to execute a poll question without <laughs> technical difficulties. <laughs> I know, right? All right, let's try it, all right? All right, well, while I'm doing this, you do that. All right, audience, your third and final poll question is on the screen now. We'd love to know what's happening over at your dealership. We want to know which online merchandising tools are you currently using on your website. Please select 
any and all that apply. Um, Ken Burns effect slideshow video. Live video walkarounds. Maybe you do live video walkarounds, which are pretty cool too. Spin car. Zoom and pan, or is it something else entirely? So we want to know which online merchandising tools are you currently using on your website? Ken Burns effect slideshow video, live video walkarounds, spin car, zoom and pan, or other. And once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close the poll and share the results. And I also wanted to let you know, we're going to be coming up to the Q&A session. So I implore you on your quest to be merchandising masters yourselves, ask the questions. Ask Devin some great questions. He's here to help. And we want to make sure that you guys are all merchandising masters. So send in your questions, and we're going to get to the Q&A session very, very shortly. And We'll be getting there soon, and people are writing in right now. I love it. So here we go. Let's close this poll. Devin, are you ready for this? You want to close the poll? Absolutely. All right, here we go. We're going to close this poll and share the results. Okay, 25%, so a quarter of today's audience, said that they use Ken Burns Effect Slideshow Video. All right? No one said they used live video walkarounds, and no one is using Spin Car yet. Now, 31% said that they use Zoom and Pan. And then we have 63%, the majority, said they use something else entirely. Devin, does that help you out? Yes, it does. That's surprising. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of automotive dealers using Zoom and Pan technology, and that's actually the genesis story of my company is related to uh, our investing in a Zoom and Pan company. So that's very interesting to see. Interesting. Okay, now let's see if we can get back. Oh, I already see your, your desktop, which is great. I don't know how that happened, but I love it. Okay, cool. <laughs> on the presentation now, Eliana, are we good? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. And audience, I'm going to ask you once again, send in those questions for Devin. We're going to be getting to the Q&A session very, very shortly. Cool. Just dipping down here to the last poll section. All right, guys. So um, six thing we're going to talk about, yes, yeah, six thing we're going to talk about is, is the handoff. Um, you know, and I think there's a real opportunity to use data to customize the handoff experience. We all know this is you know, a hotly debated or you know, hot topic to talk about is how do we make a better handoff from the online sales department to the um, on the floor sales team. And so just wanted to draw a quick parallel. I know everybody uses Apple and it's somewhat cliche, um, but you know, I think it's really pertinent to this. So a couple months ago I walked into Apple to have my computer fixed and I went in, I checked in ahead of time. Um, they said, oh, you, you, you must be Devin. I checked in. Really nice takeaway, really nice thing that they do at Apple is they wrote down my appearance so that the next person from the Genius Bar would be able to greet me by name, which is an old sales trick right? that I learned, which is if you're going to go up and meet somebody, there's a big difference in, hello, my name is Devin, and you are, and hello, you must be Jim. And so the guys at Apple are able to come up to me because they've written down my appearance, You know, what was I wearing, to just come up to me and say, Hey, you must be Devin. Um, heard you have a problem with this, this, this. How can we help you? And you know, I think that that made for a really nice transition. Um, and again, I was checked in ahead of time. I made a really nice online appointment. Um, really nice total customer experience. Compared to, I recently bought a BMW. Made an online appointment with a guy named Jeff. And I, you know, again, I'm in the industry. I figured the normal handoff experience was that the internet person would come out that I made the appointment with would come out, and then I would get an actual handoff from the internet person and then either the manager or somebody else would then hand me off to the salesperson. That didn't happen. I walked in. I asked for Jeff. Jeff wasn't there. There was no receptionist at the desk. So I'm sort of wandering around. All I wanted to do was come in. I didn't even really necessarily care to test drive this vehicle. I just wanted to come in and essentially fill out the paperwork. I'd already done my research online. Um, walking around for 20 minutes. Finally, some salesperson grabs me, tells me he's going to be back in five minutes. I walk around for another 15 minutes. Naturally, again, we talk about that difference between adversarial versus consultative approach. Naturally, now, I'm, I'm in anger, and I'm going to try to negotiate really hard with this person. You know, there goes the gross margin, essentially. You know, I was going to go and beat that guy up because he started me off. If, at the end of the day, when I care about, you know, a thousand bucks or, you know, 500 bucks, if you know, if it was a really nice, nice experience that I had with this guy and I knew that his commission was tied to it and, you know, whatever, probably not. But when I have that adversarial experience, it doesn't lend itself nicely. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a ton of room for improvement with the handoff. Um, 
couple opportunities, right? There's tools like the Next Up out there that are technology solutions to improve the handoff. I think figuring out a way to pass notes, even just about people's experience, there's opportunity. We offer a tool called Lead Intelligence Reports that shows not only what vehicles somebody's been looking at and what dealerships of yours they've been looking at, but also shows what features they've been looking at by tracking those hotspot clicks. So it shows, did somebody spend a lot of time looking at the engine and then a bunch of time on the transmission versus another person that maybe spent a bunch of time looking at cargo space and then a bunch of time looking at safety features, for example. And that allows your internet department to have a very custom conversation. It allows your sales department during the demonstration to focus on, for the first person, a you know, performance demo, and then for the next person, a kind of safety-centric or you know, convenience-centric demonstration. Um, so again, you know, I think there's a lot of value in using data to better customize the handoff. Next thing is tracking website activity to merchandise better. Current pricing tools that are out there are all supply-driven. You know, and again, this is you know coming from the, the sort of finance background. We notice that all the V Auto tools that are out there, the first look tools, the AAX tools, all just look at vehicles in market, prices in market. Before a used car manager used to be able to look out on the lot, excuse me, look out onto the lot and see what vehicles were getting activity, what vehicles were getting demoed, what vehicles were getting you know looked at and seemed to be getting a lot of interest, but then when the price tag was looked at, they were getting passed by due to price. Now, though, no one browses on the lot, they browse online. And so, you know, is there a way we can track VDP views, revisits, total time spent, et cetera, to have a comprehensive view of merchandising and, and merge that with our supply side V auto pricing techniques? Can we understand, you know, what to put on special, what to sell, et cetera, by looking at what vehicles are getting VDP views, what vehicles are, you know, getting a lot of time spent? I think revisits, something probably most of us don't track. How many consumers are revisiting, right? I mean, that's when you know somebody's getting serious. Before I bought my last car, I probably revisited it 20 times. So you knew that that vehicle was probably going to get sold, so you could probably leave it. You didn't have to spiff it. You didn't have to put it on special. You know, you could leave the price as is. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of value in trying to look at not only what's happening on the supply side with your tools like Viauto and AAX, but trying to merge that with what demand side activity is there on your website for vehicles. Um, you know, this is something that Dale Pollack actually just spoke about, um, or actually wrote about, and you know, it's something that we offer, which is called an inventory activity report. Um, so I think you know, this is something that can help with pricing. Last but not least, save the best for last. Uh, talk about the power of measurement. There's a great quote by Peter Drucker, management guru, that says, "If you can't measure it, you can't manage to it." Right. And you know, you'd be shocked at how many people don't measure their online sales performance. Um, measurement is incredibly crucial to running a business. I have to send out a board report every week that you know talks about our performance against goals and I know if I'm ever going to put out a number that's underwhelming, for that entire week it haunts me. It makes me you know do whatever I can within my power to try to get back to where I need to be for our goal. And you know that that power of measurement is really, you know, even if you don't end up actually looking at reports that people put together, forcing them to put it together and go through that process has tremendous value. So what we're going to talk about is mostly tier three level conversion. And so there's a bunch of different types of conversion. There's unique BD, unique visitor to VDP visitor. This essentially measures the effectiveness of your homepage. So if I'm driving people to my homepage, how many of them actually then go and visit VDP pages? Um, We've got VDP visitors to engage visitors. So this, you can draw an arbitrary line. Let's say how many people that land on my VDP pages spend at least 20 seconds. Um, VDP visitors to lead submission. So this is, you know, this is a lot of times what people look at for conversion rates. How good is my VDP page converting? Pages converting. VDP visitors click to call, basically the same thing. Obviously, number five, we can't track VDP visitors to walk-ins. Um, this is, you know, sort of the the white whale that a lot of people outside of automotive are trying to figure out. How do I know if somebody spent a bunch of time on my site and then just walked in and bought a car? Um, you know, there, people are working on some geofencing techniques and stuff to track this. Calls to appointment set. Some of these now look at your um, more your sales department effectiveness. So that's your kind of BDC. How effective are they at setting appointments? Lead submissions to appointment set. Again, a BDC metric. Appointment set to demos. So that's you know essentially how's my follow up process if I set an appointment. Do I have a good reminder process to make sure that person comes in? I think we're all probably tracking demos to closes. That's essentially a sales metric. Number 10, unique visitors to closes. That's your sort of all-encompassing. I drive 
20,000 people to my site by spending $20,000, how many vehicles did I actually sell? But in order to understand that, we have to break it down into these micro granular levels. And so what we put together is um, a metrics dashboard, which is right here. Um, and this is actually also available in the handout section. If you go in, you can click and download this. And essentially what this shows is a bunch of those different metrics to measure your website effectiveness. If you just require your internet manager to produce this on a weekly basis, requiring them to put it in writing will force them to think about it, look at ways to improve it. Um, you know, it'll allow you to identify trends. This is a simple, simple takeaway, I think, is, again, just if you're not doing something like this, obviously somebody wrote in that they are looking at a variety of metrics, which is awesome. A lot of the dealers that I work with don't. Um, this is a way to hold your internet department accountable. It's a way to start to understand things. It's a good start. This is sort of a boilerplate one that we've included in the handout section. If you'd like, though, we'd be happy to help, happy to help put together one that's sort of custom for your sales process. That's what we do sort of throughout our process. So we'd love to jump in and help if we can. Again, the eight steps to mastery. This will all be available. I know we're kind of running short on time, so just wanted to sort of throw this up there. A couple other suggested resources. Again, the metrics dashboard is available in the handout section. If you read our blog, we're always putting out content about you know, where we see opportunity. We're putting out content about, okay, you know, we've worked with a thousand dealers and this is where we saw an average conversion rate or this is what we saw as an average metric and we were able to move it this much if you guys simply do this thing. Um, the HubSpot marketing blog, for you guys that don't know this, I mean, that, that's an absolutely insanely awesome library of resources. Automotive Moneyball by CDK is another good resource. And again, just the action items. If you guys aren't already doing it, I would strongly suggest having your internet manager or BDC manager put together some sort of dashboard like that, um, set attainable goals, and track changes and improvements through BDP pages. So without further ado, we'll enter the Q&A session. I love it. I love it. Devin, thank you so much. I learned a lot today. Audience, I know you did too. If you have any questions for Devin about how to become a merchandising master or maybe something that's happening specifically at your dealership, send them on in. We're going to get to those questions in just a moment. Before we do that, though, oh, I wish I had some game show music on me right now, but I don't. But it's that time. If you missed it at the beginning of the webinar, I announced that our good friends over at Spin Car, they're giving away an awesome prize today on the webinar. One of you lucky webinar attendees is going to win three months of Spin Car for free. Spin Car is going to automatically stitch together standard interior and exterior vehicle photographs into that super interactive 360 degree display that Devin showed you earlier. It's going to have tagged touchable hotspots with analytics that track every interaction your shoppers make with your inventory, an average increase in time spent on VDPs of 56%, and a guaranteed 10% increase in sales. I'm sorry, in leads, Spin Car is the go-to 360 degree automotive merchandising solution for dealers nationwide. This is an awesome prize for your dealership. It's also by the way, a great way to improve your merchandising coming into the holidays. So, needless to say, you're going to want this. All you have to do is answer a simple question about the presentation. So what I need you to do is get to your keyboards, get ready, get those fingers nimble. First one to write in the correct response to the giveaway question is going to be the one walking away with this cool prize today. And of course, vendors, as you can probably tell, this isn't a prize for you. So please sit this one out. This prize is intended for dealership personnel only. We do appreciate it, though. Um, good luck, everyone. And I'm curious, Devin, Knowing the question that we had planned, I don't remember if you actually said the answer to this question. Did you? Uh, I, I think I did highlight on it. Yeah? Okay. Then we're going to go with it. All right, audience, if you don't know, hey, take a guess. We're totally okay with that, too. All right? Here we go. Good luck, everyone. Earlier in the show, Devin took us live online to show us how spin car works. The question is, how many hotspots did Devin say a dealer could use on their spin car display? How many hotspots in total? And no one has gotten the answer. Yeah, I'm wondering if you didn't say it, Devin. <laughs> 
Yeah, we may. Yeah, I, 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 I might have. My apologies. If so. <laughs> I wonder you didn't say it. Um, yeah, some people are saying I don't think he did, and they're running the gamut on the numbers. They're putting a lot of numbers up there. Um, but no one has gotten it. <laughs> I, I, I don't know I if apologize. there's a hint we could give. I don't know what to do. Hey Mike, did they did he say the answer to that one? Okay, no one's gotten the answer. So yeah, I don't I don't know if we should try and come up with a different you're more than welcome to keep guessing, people. <laughs> no one's gotten it yet. No. All right. Uh Devin, is there another question we can oh, wait a second. We have a winner. Kind awesome. of. Yeah, we have a winner. Well, I'm going to give it to him because it's the closest one we got. Tim Dill, congratulations. His answer was infinity, and the actual answer was as many as they want. So I'm going to go with it. Tim Dill, congratulations. <laughs> You're our winner today. Tim, remind me, sir, what dealership are you with? Write on in and let me know. Tim Dill, you have just won three awesome months of Spin Car. Good luck with that. And that is an awesome, awesome, amazing prize for you. He is with McKinnon Toyota Nissan. Tim Dill, congratulations. You're going to be hearing from our good friends over at Spin Car about getting that Spin Car installed on your website as soon as possible. Thank you so much, everyone, for playing along. Hey, don't worry if you didn't win today's prize because you know what we give away prizes every week at every webinar come on back for another dealer on webinar and see if you can win the giveaway then all right so thank you everyone for playing along congratulations to Tim Dill today's winner and of course we got to thank our good friends at spin car for their incredible generosity thank you so much all right Devin if you're ready we're gonna go to some questions from the audience are you ready Absolutely. All right, audience, if you haven't gotten your question in yet for Devin, send them on in. We're going to get to those right now. Okay, first question comes to you from Andy. Andy says, what do you mean by above or below the fold? Devin, that's from Andy. Sure. Oh, uh, also, you can turn on your webcam, too, if you wanted, Devin. Can see me? I see you. <laughs> what I wanted to do here is just show you guys quickly um, what we mean by that. So above or below the fold, if you look at you know a typical website, um, the fold is essentially, if you think about like the newspaper, right, where's the, the fold in the newspaper, it's essentially where when you land, wherever that bottom piece is cut off and you have to scroll to see anything below it. And so in traditional e-commerce, it's really important that you get all of the valuable information up in that prime real estate above the fold. So again, it's just that line at which you need to scroll to see anything below it. That makes sense? It makes sense to me. Andy, if you have another follow-up question, please don't hesitate to write on back in. We'd love to see what else we can help you out with. All right, um, next question. Uh, we had a lot of questions that came in about the hotspots actually. So for instance, Steph. Steph wrote in, how do the dots get applied to the vehicles? And I'm pretty sure that, that Steph was talking about the hotspots. Great, uh, great question. So there's three different kinds of hotspots uh, that our product offers. We offer standard hotspots, conditional hotspots, and custom hotspots. So standard hotspots automatically get applied. And all of this happens during the setup process. We figure out you know, what do you guys want to tag? What's important to your customer base? Um, and so what we'll do is we have standard hotspots that will apply to all vehicles. And you can segregate that for new, used, CPO, for example. But those are usually things like I want to include why buy videos in a hotspot on all my vehicles. I want to include I always want to put in a close-up shot of the wheel. I always want to put in a close-up shot of the engine. Then conditional hotspots, we set up a logical architecture that says if this vehicle has a sunroof, then include a hotspot on the sunroof. If it doesn't, don't include it. Or if this F-150 has an aluminum frame, include the video from Ford about the aluminum frame. Um, and then there's things called custom hotspots. So those are things that we couldn't possibly do automatically, like denser dings or aftermarket features like you know aftermarket rims, for example. In those, we show usually a used car manager, whomever's writing the comments, 
we'll show them how to use an interface, which is a really fast way to just add a hotspot that says, you know, here's a ding, here's a close-up shot of it, or here's aftermarket rims with a $5,000 MSRP, for example, you know, $2,000 MSRP, for example. And those hotspots can contain close-up images like you saw. They can contain OEM collateral, like I mentioned with the Ford um, video. They can contain video of any sort, whether that's why buy or OEM stuff. There can even be HTML content, so you can put calls to action or even link into the Carfax. Um, so that's kind of how it works. It all happens automatically, but for the custom hotspots, which there's an interface for people to go in and tag. That makes sense? It makes sense to me, and I think that uh, along with Steph's question, that I think we might have also covered uh, Mike's question, because Mike said, can you explain how those hotspots work? I, was there anything else you needed to add to help Mike out, or do you think we got it? <laughs> I think we got it. They're all customizable for branding, um, you know, and coloration. I love Again, it. Yeah, it happens automatically, and you know, the, we can even customize like whatever they look like depending on if you have a certain logo for your dealership. I was just showing sort of standard user interface. Oh yeah, and then I noticed that all of the ones, all of the examples that you showed me, all had that nice. Uh, turquoise color can that also be changed maybe to match the dealer's logo or something like that or yep either the dealer's logo or the brand for so like you know Honda we have some Honda dealers that do blue or Toyota dealers that'll do red so yeah you just provide us with the hex color during the setup process and we'll change for that color oh really cool okay uh, David wrote in he says that all sounds pretty impressive I agree I agree okay next oh, actually this is uh, our last question unless somebody else writes one in Anthony, hi Anthony. Anthony says, what are your thoughts on what the first picture should be on a VLP or SRP? The three-quarter picture, the front view, the interior view, what do you think? Great question. Um, I'll answer that, you know, sort of in the multiple choice fashion. I think it should be a three-quarter view, but I think a lot of people do the wrong three-quarter view shot. So let me see if I can find an SRP to kind of show you guys what I'm talking about. An old print advertising trick is to always have the um, the vehicle or whatever imagery it is sort of point so that your eyes naturally flow from the image into the copy. So let's see if we can find one here, and I'll show you what the difference is. So, eh, hang on one sec. So as you can see, these are pointing. This is a passenger three-quarter shot. And then all of the copy is to the right, um, so your eyes naturally flow from you know the left to the right of the vehicle right into that copy. So that's the kind of shot you want. If your copy is on the other side, you'd want to you'd want a driver side three quarter shot from the front. Um, I think you've got to go with an exterior shot just to illustrate what type of vehicle it is, what color. I mean, lots of those things are sort of binary decisions. If it's not that vehicle or it's not that color, I don't really care what the interior looks like. So. Um, again, I think a three-quarter shot, but have it point in the direction of the copy that's next to it and all the, the textual information on the SRP. Very interesting. I like it. I like it. And we did have one last question that came in from Steve. Steve wants to know how long it takes to get a car onto spin car. Sure. So the way spin car works is we just take a feed file, so a CSV file that you're generally already sending. Um, to all the third-party sites through whatever distribution tool you use, HomeNet, um, V Auto, whichever ones of those you use. You just add the spin car FTP as one of the FTP distribution points. And then as soon as we get a feed file from you, we turn it around in usually about two to three minutes. So it's nearly instantaneous. Oh, wow. That's really fast. All right, audience, I just want to remind you, we're going to be uh, start to close out the show while Devin does his magic on his end right now. Um, I just wanted to remind you to check out the handouts section of the GoToWebinar interface. In there you'll see that there's two handouts. One of the handouts is the uh, uh, PDF of the slide deck, the slide deck that you just saw that Devin used. So you definitely want to uh, get that right directly from there. And then the second one is an active Excel spreadsheet. It's the Spin Car Dashboard, which is going to help you uh, uh, help you with all of your merchandising. Isn't that right, Devin? Yep, exactly. So that'll help you understand sort of the, the funnel. It'll, it's basically just a template for you to track your website conversion rates and other metrics that are important to give you basically 
a place for your internet department to fill out a report card that they can send you on a weekly basis. Ah, uh, that's awesome. That's really, really awesome. So this is all stuff to help you. And of course, if there's any other questions that you have that we haven't gotten to during the webinar, feel free to reach out to Devin directly. Him and the nice people over at SpinCar, they're ready to help you with all of your merchandising needs, okay? So thank you so much for being here today, Devin. I loved what you talked about. It was really, really enlightening. And I hope you had fun on a dealer on webinar. Absolutely. <laughs> Audience, we're going to be closing out the webinar now, but just so you know, we have recorded this awesome webinar for you, and we are going to be sending out the link so that you can download a copy of today's webinar recording. We're also going to share it with you online. All you have to go do is go to dealeron.com slash webinars to view our upcoming webinar schedule or access any of our past webinars too. Also, at the conclusion of this webinar, you're going to get a short survey. We need you to fill it out. We're always looking for your feedback. Today, we're going to randomly select a couple of people from all those completed surveys to win some Google prizes. Now, this, this survey is only six questions, so please give us your feedback. We want to know what you thought of today's presentation. And invitations will be going out tomorrow for our next webinar. How to drive market share and sales right from the service lane. Yeah, you can do it. There's no denying it. The service department is the heart of net profits for a dealership and the lifeblood of its profitability. However, if your selling style doesn't include a targeted focus on the service department, then your dealership is definitely losing sales and market share. In this eye-opening one-hour webinar, Bill Wittenmeyer will provide a roadmap on how dealers can use advanced technology and multi-channel engagement that will revolutionize your sales opportunities and streamline processes while providing the transparency that consumers are demanding. Attendees will also receive compelling sales tactics and fixed operation management tools that can be implemented immediately to drive higher sales revenue and loyalty. Attendees will also learn tips on smarter technology that identifies more business opportunities, drives a higher conversion rate and ROI. You're going to learn how to increase productivity and use transparency to close more sales more profitably. And you're going to learn multi-channel engagement strategies that generate remarkable customer experiences and loyalty. So if you're ready to learn how to drive market share and sales right from the service lane, then this is the website you simply can't afford to miss. Register now and don't forget, DealerOn's weekly webinars are held Thursdays, 12 noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, and 9 a.m. Pacific. If you have any questions or suggestions regarding these webinars and our topics, hey, contact me directly. Again, I'm Eliana Reggio, and I want to hear from you. So track me down online. I'm everywhere. Facebook, Twitter, Google+, all the automotive social networks. You can also email me directly at eliana at dealeron.com. Thank you all so very much for spending this time with us today, and I hope to see you all in another webinar in DealerOn's continuing education series. Take care.